Thank you. Thank you to the organizers of ASAP. Thank you to our hosts, Dr. Trumbull and Dr. Hager, for having me speak today. I'm going to talk about occult tether court, which is related to most of the topics we've been talking about today, Chiari malformations, connective tissue disorder, otherwise called dysraphism. So why does this happen? Essentially, we're talking about tethering or anchoring of the spinal cord to some inelastic structure. The spinal column grows faster than the spinal cord and nerves, so the spinal cord has to be elastic to keep up with the growth of the vertebral column. Anything that's within the spinal cord, fat, tumor, uh, cyst, scarring, anything like that that causes the spinal cord to be less elastic causes tethering. The spinal cord can also be uh, stuck to a bony abnormality within the canal, or just can be thickened, which means that there's increased scar tissue and fat within the spinal cord. So this is the first report that we have really in the literature of tethering, it wasn't called tethering. And it described a patient with scoliosis. It was thought that the patient's scoliosis was so severe that it was causing the tethering. The patient was, he had surgery for the scoliosis, but the symptoms really didn't get much better. Um, now we know that this is longitudinal stress within the spinal cord, which causes abnormal metabolism within the spinal cord and leads to neurologic deficit. So actually addressing the spinal cord tethering, untethering it, releasing it from whatever structure it's stuck to is what results in improvement. Harold Hoffman's group in uh, Toronto first coined the term tether spinal cord, and then Shoki Yamada in California expanded the term to include tumors, um, patients with spina bifida, and so on. So this is generally a neurulation defect. It happens uh, between about the fourth and the 11th weeks of gestation. Um, and that results in you know, spina bifida earlier in gestation. And then later, the spinal cord lipomas, also known as lipomyelomeningocele, the split cord malformations, dermoid and epidermoid tumors within the spinal cord. So in these patients, we see weakness in the legs, we can see muscle atrophy, gait changes, problems with sensation. They can be, have increased reflexes or decreased reflexes. And then bowel and bladder uh, dysfunction is really the most common denominator of tethered cord. We see masses sometimes, which causes some asymmetry in the appearance of a baby's back, for example. The midline dimples, tufts of hair, it's very important that these lesions are midline. If they're off to the side, if they're kind of lower than about S2, they probably don't indicate tethering. Although the site of a lesion on the back doesn't always correlate with the site of tethering. Progressive scoliosis can be caused by tethered cord uh, just as it can be caused by Chiari. And then the foot deformities that we see. In older children, uh, we may see back pain, leg pain, and knee pain. So this is a, a newborn who had this skin-covered lesion. Um, and at surgery, when this sort of bubble is opened up, then we see a uh, very small, actually, defect in the, in the um, soft tissues, the muscle, uh, the fat, leading down to the spinal canal. And that was able to just be repaired. And then all of this excess skin excised and closed. Maybe a lot less striking than that. The neonatal ICU residents noticed uh, this baby. And you just see this small lesion right here in the midline. And you can't appreciate it, but underneath was a dime-sized defect with fluid underneath it. And they picked that up. That was a tethered cord. Ooh, going too fast. Um, another example of an abnormal sacral dimple that I'll see in the office that indicates an underlying problem with the spinal cord. Um, hemangiomas on the skin here or here. And then this is uh, an example of the hairy patch that you've probably heard of. Um, hairy patches, tufts of hair, pretty um, you know, well correlated with split cord malformations along with leg length discrepancies. <clears throat> 
and then the deviated, deviated gluteal cleft, bifid cleft, sacral dimple, uh, and then here this um, newborn had this skin lesion that almost looked like a cigarette burn, but you notice all of these lesions are midline, and that's very important. Okay, this gentleman um, had always had back pain, leg pain, bowel and bladder dysfunction. Um, nobody knows why. Over the last couple of years, he started having more bowel and bladder dysfunction and um, sexual dysfunction. And he turned out to have this tethered cord. You see his, on his MRI, spinal cord is extending all the way down to S2, and then he has this big lipoma here. And I can tell you there was a defect in the bone here where the lipoma was actually coming out, which will make sense when I show you how these things form. Uh, they can have, uh, people can have any of these types of foot deformities in association with tether cord as well. Scoliosis. This is a young boy who was, had, progressed, um, had presented with progressive scoliosis, and after untethering, his spine straightened nicely. So how do we diagnose tethered cord with all of these symptoms and signs? MRI is kind of the gold standard, um, but it's really a clinical diagnosis. We get urodynamics um, and sometimes the EMG nerve conduction study, but it's really a clinical diagnosis. It's the patient's symptoms and signs. MRI really tells us where the patient is tethered, not so much whether or not they're tethered. When they have you know, symptoms, signs on exam that go along with tethering, and then a kind of suspicious MRI, we usually explore them. So this is another patient who had a uh, spinal cord lipoma. This is a transitional spinal cord lipoma. They may be transitional, terminal, or dorsal, meaning that the nerve roots, as you can see, are involved with the abnormality at the bottom, and the spinal cord is pulled down low. They're not always low-lying. At surgery, here's our spinal cord, our nerves coming out on both sides, looking through the microscope, and you just see the spinal cord disappearing into this mass of lipoma. And a lot of the time, the lipoma has blown through the dura, the, the uh, muscle layers, and the fat, but this can be untethered. Uh, now you see the um, nerve roots were actually not involved in this lipoma here. They were coming out underneath it and below it. And so here, most of the lipoma has been resected. So the goal of surgery is to not necessarily resect all of the lesion that's tethering the spinal cord, but to separate it from the spinal cord, and then separate it enough, resect enough of the lipoma um, or enough of the abnormality that it can't just stick back together and retether. This is an example of a um, large epidermoid tumor. Uh, the spinal cord is here, and this is actually fairly normal looking. And then you see this widening, and this is all sort of precursors of skin. It actually was growing here. Uh, so this was able to be uh, resected and then tethered circumferentially. So how this happens, again, you, the neural tube is rolling up during the process of you know, embryonic formation, and you have these primitive elements that will become skin, um, sometimes bone, muscle. For whatever reason, we have uh, non-disjunction, and these elements get into the spinal cord and start to grow. And that's what causes the lipomas, the epidermoid tumors, the dermoids. This is a dorsal uh, spinal cord lipoma. Here you see this fat signal here, spinal cord is again pulled down low. And then here in the axial view, you see the spinal cord with the nerves coming out, but then here's this lipoma here, and this is tethering the spinal cord. And then sometimes um, it's just a thickened phylum or a terminal phylum lipoma in which uh, the end of the spinal cord is stuck to the lipoma. And even though it's coming out of the spinal cord, after the nerve roots are all dissected away and going to their foramina, you can usually just divide this and then resect enough of the lipoma that it doesn't retether. Okay. So this baby um, was born with this, um, this lesion, pretty obvious. Again, midline. Also note 
the bifid gluteal cleft, asymmetric cleft, as well as the tuft of hair. And he had a type 1 split cord malformation, which is also called diastomatomyelia. And the type 1 split cords, they actually have a bony spicule here that divides the spinal cord in half. So the nerve roots from the right half of the spinal cord come off the right, the left side of the body come off the left, and you have the spicule here. These are always tethered. They are tethered by the midline bony spicule, but they're also tethered at the end of each half of the spinal cord. So when these are done, the midline spicule has to be resected, but also both phyla have to be divided for it really to be completely untethered. And in the same uh, baby, the spinal cords were continuing down as halves. This little girl has open spina bifida that you see, but I show this slide to show this tuft of hair. And this marks actually an additional abnormality she had up high, a split cord malformation. Um, note also the foot deformities that go along with this. And so here you can kind of appreciate on her MRI, and it's not the greatest because she was so young, but she has a type, one, a type two split cord malformation in which she doesn't have the bony spicule, but the spinal cord is divided in two, and in here, there's always a membrane. Again, they're always tethered to the membrane and they're always tethered distally. So it's important to untether both of those. And then this is just a schematic of how that forms. At surgery, a type two split cord malformation, you see one half of the spinal cord here with the nerves coming out, the other half on this side with the nerves coming here, and then the, just a membrane in between. So do these always have to be untethered? Well, it depends on you know, when someone comes to you. Someone who's uh, fully grown, who has a split cord malformation, but has never been untethered, leg length discrepancy, but sort of stable function, I might not. We untether patients based on whether they have a progressive deficit. Um, whether they're worsening as far as bowel and bladder function, whether they have pain. You're not going to reverse a deficit that someone's had since birth um, by operating on them. So you just have to do that sort of decision making. This um, is a 17-year-old uh, girl who had never been able to move the fifth toe of one foot. That was her only deficit. But she also had a mark in the midline of her back, very similar to that cigarette burn kind of mark I showed you on the other baby. And um, it hadn't you know, really been addressed or looked into. And you can just see on her MRI, you see the syrinx here, but you also can just appreciate a little shadow right here and also here. Um, at surgery, she had this uh, neural tissue coming out, actually going through all the way up to the lesion on her back, and that's a monke, which we rarely see, but is an indication of an underlying uh, tethered cord. She had a split cord malformation and she had a neuroenteric cyst here that was displacing the spinal cord over. Um, so uh, she was untethered actually to resect the mass. So is not moving your one toe of one foot disabling? No, you wouldn't operate on somebody for that. But a mass that displaces the spinal cord over and you don't know what it is, yeah, they get an operation. And then we go ahead and untether as long as we're there. Another type of um, occult dysraphism or occult tethered cord, uh, cautilagenesis. As you can see here, uh, this is uh, comparing to a, no a relative normal. There's a disc here, but the spinal cord and the coccyx is normal. This baby is cut off. The sacrum and tailbone didn't form. When we see this, these are always tethered, and they usually have a kind of thickened phylum here. So it's usually not a giant lipoma or anything like that. It's usually a thickened phylum that is you know, larger than all the nerve roots that you see. And it's able to be just grafted, coagulated, and divided uh, after all of the nerve roots have come off. In that kind of problem, the spinal cord, nerve roots, everything has just fused together at the bottom of this incomplete sacrum. And so that's um, literally they're tethered to the sacrum. Okay.
So there's been a lot of interest, I would say, over the last 20 years or so in occult tethered cord, what we call minimal tethered cord, and treatment for neurogenic bowel and bladder. It's pretty well recognized that these findings can be subtle. Um, the spinal cord phylum or conus is not always low-lying. Nobody knows why that is. I don't think that patients are, you know, tethered or not tethered. I think it's a degree of tethering, and that relates to when they present, you know, do, are they born with foot abnormalities and abnormal bowel and bladder, or is this something that becomes symptomatic as teenagers with uh, frequent urinary tract infections, for example, urinary leaking and things like that. Um, this is a 12-year-old uh, boy I had seen for back pain, and I thought he had a good example of what normal looks like. Here's his uh, spinal cord handing high here. Nerve roots are just coming down the cauda equina and going where they're supposed to go. In this one, you see the spinal cord kind of angled within the canal. It's more forward at the top, more, more posterior at the back, and then you see the nerve roots coming very close to the back of the canal this way. They're not just freely within the spinal canal as you'd expect. If you look at the normal here, the nerve roots are in cross section, and they're all kind of like dotted within the um, uh, spinal canal, as opposed to the bottom of the spinal cord here pulled to the back, almost uh, suggestive of like a guitar string under tension. Mm -hmm. And so when you see that, when you see the more f subtle kind of cord, most of the time you will find this, this is what we call a fatty phylum or a thickened phylum. It's not tethered specifically to something, but it's much thicker, much wider than it should be, much straighter with, uh, within the spinal canal, and that's a tethered cord. Okay. So the relation of Chiari malformations to tethered cord. Um, across the country, reports are about 15%. Um, in uh, our own series, we saw about 7 8% uh, correlation with Chiari 1 malformation and tethered spinal cord. Um, a severely tethered cord can cause Chiari symptoms, um, but I have not seen it in isolation. In other words, uh, if the patient has a severely tethered cord, uh, they will also have tethered cord symptoms. And usually that will be a little more prominent than the Chiari symptoms. But if it's bad, they can have symptoms in the upper extremities. They can have you know, some symptoms of traction throughout the neuroaxis. This is a 15-year-old boy who had um, sleep apnea. Because he wasn't sleeping, he was chronically ill, chronically fatigued. He was missing school. He had, um, you know, chronic infections all the time, neck pain. And those were the symptoms that he came to me with. We did an MRI of his brain. He did not have a Chiari malformation. But on further questioning, his legs and feet jerked all the time when he was sleeping. He'd had urinary hesitancy for a couple of years. He didn't think this was abnormal, because you know, in kids, however they are, is they're normal. That's, oh, everybody has to stand at the toilet and sort of push for a while before they go, you know. Um, and then constipation, numbness and tingling in the hands and feet. And his parents had noticed that his symptoms got worse with growth. On exam, he was hy very hyperreflexic, uh, and he had a sleep study that showed, you know, confirmed the central apneas. And this is how he sleeps, this is, or he used to. This is a picture of him sleeping that his mother shared with me. So he sort of extends his neck and almost tries to shorten his spinal cord while he's sleeping to take the tension off. And this was his um, MRI, his lumbar spine MRI, again showing the spinal cord angled dorsally and the spinal cord sitting here at the back of the spinal canal because, you know, the canal is curving, but the cord is pulled more straight. And at surgery, I have already opened the dura, but here's his phylum pulled very straight within the canal compared to the other nerve roots. And at the time that I opened the dura, this structure, which is the end of the spinal cord, the phylum was stuck to the dura. All of his symptoms resolved. His, his um, sleep apnea resolved. Because he was getting sleep, he was no longer sick all the time. He was back to getting straight A's. Um, he's in college now. Uh, he's a neuroscience major, and he wants to be a neurosurgeon, which makes me very happy. 
This is another little girl I had seen. I, you know, we get asked a lot of the time, does tether cord cause a curie or can it? Well, it, it can, but again, we usually see more prominent tethered cord symptoms than the curie symptoms. But this was a little girl who uh, was born with a horseshoe kidney. Um, she had gross motor delay. She was 18 months old. She still wasn't walking. She had failure to thrive, poor feeding. So the failure to thrive and poor feeding kind of suggests Chiari to you. And she had this MRI, which did show tonsillar herniation here, down to C1. There's her C1. So her cerebellar tonsil was extending down to the bottom of C1. When we hear of abnormalities of the urogenital system, bony abnormalities, um, she had some scoliosis, as you can appreciate on her MRI here, and um, uh, poor uh, walking, poor gait, you immediately think tethered cord. And she did have this uh, syrinx as well as this thickening of the phylum here. On cross-section, you can appreciate she had a, what we call a myelocystocele, or she had a cyst surrounding her uh, spinal cord in addition to the thickening of the spinal cord. So uh, we released her spinal cord. She had a spinal cord untethering. And then four months later, she had uh, a repeat brain MRI, and you see the Chiari had reversed. So we have uh, followed her, and she's continued to do well. Our feeding improved. Um, all of her motor milestones and everything improved. OK. How am I doing on time? OK. Just a few quick cases. Um, Six-year-old uh, who presents with urinary and fecal incontinence about three to four times a day. Six years old, they can have accidents, but you really would expect them to be potty trained and not having that problem anymore. And then here you see the spinal cord sitting at the back of the canal instead of more in the center where you'd expect. And so he has this tethered cord here with this thickened phylum. Uh, he got untethered, all symptoms resolved. His milestones were normal. So he had walked on time, he had done everything. You know, every patient, just like with Chiari, every patient with tethered cord doesn't have every symptom. This is a young girl who had had uh, back pain for four months, uh, 14 years old, and it was blamed on softball. You know, she was very athletic, um, but it hadn't gone away, so she got this MRI. And you appreciate, again, her conus is not low-lying, but her spinal cord is very straight, and then she has this bright signal. This was a dorsal spinal cord lipoma, like the one I showed you earlier, not as big, but again, tethering the spinal cord. And um, her back pain resolved following untethering. 13-month-old uh, thir female who had a deviated gluteal cleft. Again, spinal cord is angled posteriorly here. The phylum here is thicker than it should be, thicker than the surrounding nerve roots. And you can appreciate it there, pulled dorsally. At surgery, and sometimes we find the not only is the phylum thickened and straight, but the spinal cord is tethered with adhesion circumferentially that we have to release. These are findings that won't show up on MRI. So all you see is that the spinal cord is held in an abnormal position, but it's these adhesions that are a lot of the time holding it that way. So it's sort of evidence of tethering, even though you don't directly see what's tethering the cord. And then this um, six-month-old male had had the, uh, a midline uh, hemangioma and a deviated gluteal cleft. He had a syrinx within the spinal cord, but he also had this filar cyst and thickened phylum here. He had surgery, his cyst here at the, bottom of the, um, at the beginning of the phylum, and then very thickened phylum here, almost as thick as the spinal cord itself. Okay. Um, this is a 17-year-old uh, who underwent spinal tap and then became paralyzed. She um, couldn't move her legs for about a day or two and then started getting movement back. And very, very subtle findings, of course, of tethered cord, but there it is, pulled dorsally and thickened. And she underwent uh, spinal cord untethering, regained everything. Okay, so this little girl um, had had uh, high arches and progressive clumsiness. If you notice the left calf here, 
is, um, wait a minute, left gift, is bigger than the right also. Uh, progressively um, increasing high arches, hammer toes uh, that progress over time, very suggestive of tethering and spinal cord. And this is her film, Tethered. So again, notice most of our occult dysraphism, um, most of our occult tether cords will not have a low-lying conus. Accordingly, a lot of these will not be read as tethered by radiology. Um, but you have to look at these subtle findings, and it's really a clinical decision you make. If I see an MRI like that 12-year-old boy with the back pain I was using as normal, even with all these clinical findings, I would not operate on them. Um, so the, the MRIs are abnormal, but they're just not within the classic definition of tethering that's generally in the radiology literature. At surgery, she had a tight phylum, which I haven't actually shown. Not thickened, just pulled too tightly within the um, canal and tethered to the dura down low. And that's just released. No, I forgot what I was showing here. So anyway, uh, this is my last case. This is a six-year-old girl with a sacromyelomeningocele that had been closed at birth. And we were doing a nerve rerouting study. So um, she was explored, but not specifically for spinal cord untethering. We were looking at rerouting these sacral roots um, to the bladder to restore bladder or continence for patients with spina bifida. So, here you see low-lying conus, spinal cord is pulled within the canal, and the spinal cord is sitting right dorsally here. She was not tethered at surgery. She was not adherent at all. So again, spinal cord tethering is a clinical diagnosis. It's not primarily based on the MRI appearance, but if someone has the usual signs and symptoms of subtle tethering, then you know, we go ahead and explore with additional testing and particularly if there's no other explanation for the deficits. Thank you.